ourselves underway. Thank you. So we've got uh, quiet because we've we've only got an hour and a half. We've got a great lineup and a fantastic topic. So uh, so let let's give it the the full one and a half hours. Um, state capacity. We've got uh, we couldn't have a better panel. So we've got uh, Tim Besley here, who's written a lot on state capacity. Um, Kieran Holmes, who's built a lot of state capacity, um, and uh, Stefan Durkin, who's funded a lot of state capacity <laughs> building. At least you didn't say I destroyed it. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I recently read uh, Angus Deaton's little book, Great Escape, um, which I recommend, and it's a, it's, a, it's a book about public health and the, the triumph of public health um, especially uh, in the late 19th century in, in, in Europe. And um, if you go to 1850, health states were terrible in cities, amazingly high death rates. Um, and by 1900, um, death rates had started to really come down a lot. Uh, and what, what had changed in between? So. One thing that changed was knowledge. Germ theory of disease was discovered. Another thing was uh, the politics had changed. People had got the vote. And so uh, that shifted the balance of power within city councils. But a third thing that changed was the building of organizational capacity. Um, Deaton stresses just how difficult it was the gap from intending to do something, wanting to do something, and actually getting a uh, clean water supply built in a city. So it could be knowledge, uh, it could be intention, it could be organizational capacity. We've got all three represented here. Um, we're going to start with Kieran Holmes. Kieran, um, I'm surprised you're still alive because um, <laughs> Me too. many firms must wish you weren't. Um, Kieran has built effective tax authorities in places that didn't have them and radically raised uh, tax take. So perhaps you could tell us how it's done. Um, the rest of the panel is going to get up and march out just so that we can see your PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about state capacity and revenue collection. It's my strong belief that all states, particularly fragile and low-income states, have the capacity to significantly, significantly raise far greater domestic revenues than they currently do. The fact that they failed to raise the revenues that they could is due to a combination of domestic resistance amongst their elites corruption, and to a lesser extent, an inability to recognize their own capacity for revenue generation. At the very least, states fail to grasp the real costs of tax exemptions that are dispensed, often in return for a value of corruption that is, of course, much less than the value of the taxes foregone. <clears throat> in the past, donor resistance to domestic taxation was a factor, and while this has now lessened, I will argue that aid can and should do more to encourage domestic revenue mobilization. I'll speak about my experiences in delivering tax reform, and I will try to set out some strategies on what more could be done. This presentation is on how to unlock revenue potential in poor countries, but first let us remind ourselves why these states particularly need to raise revenues. <clears throat> Low-income states uh, require efficient revenue collection to finance human development and recovery through the provision of public goods. Aid is essential to achieve that, however it is simply not enough compared with the magnitude of what needs to be financed. 
According to the OECD, the volume of aid to fragile states has followed an erratic and downward trend, partly due to the financial crisis. Many countries in Africa generate revenues in the low to mid-teens in terms of revenue as a percentage of their gross domestic product, and some are even below 10%. But yet the UN estimates that a 20% tax to GDP ratio is required to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. Although tax to GDP ratios are suboptimal, tax revenue remains the most promising source of revenue for developing countries, outstripping as it does foreign aid, emigrants' remittances and foreign direct investment. For example, a 1% increase in Ethiopia's tax take, tax to GDP ratio is roughly the equivalent of all UK aid to Ethiopia. With regard to their sovereignty, developing countries also need to reduce their dependency on aid, but yet these countries depend on aid for more than 50% of their budgets. There are other benefits to taxation. Taxes help address inequalities by providing the funds for health care and education to those who could not normally pay for these services. And as we all know, inequalities are strong determinants of civil conflicts. Taxes provide the funds for internal and external security, thus creating an environment in which business growth can occur. Taxes help address fraud and corruption through strong information technology systems, single taxpayer identification numbers, and modern tax assessment systems. Essentially, taxes strengthen the state, and this allows the state to invest in infrastructure that is conducive to investment and economic growth. By paying their taxes, citizens invest in the state, and in turn, the state is forced to become more responsive to its taxpaying citizens. A central theme of my argument is that, given the overwhelming benefits of domestic revenue mobilization, donors and the international community in general must do more to facilitate countries to maximize their own revenue collection potential. So, my, I will begin to say that all states have the capacity to raise more revenues. But it's worth remembering that according to the African Development Bank, Africa is a net creditor to the rest of the world to the tune of $1.4 trillion in the last 30 years. Net foreign inflows into Africa in the form of foreign aid, foreign direct investment and emigrants' remittances fell short of the outflows by this amount. The outflows include substantial payments into tax havens, hidden bank accounts, and transfer pricing, and other means of value extraction. If this sum is accurate, it means Africa is contributing far more to the development of the rest of the world than the rest of the world is contributing to Africa's development. If this sum is true, it also provides us with a measure of the benefits to be gained by helping countries introduce more transparent fiscal systems and by combating the ease by which some countries and entities can offer bank secrecy and systems to deliver opaque ownership of assets, much favored by corrupt elites. I, I just want to illustrate the potential for revenue reform with a brief outline of the gains in revenues in some of the countries in which I've worked. I started my working life in, in, this, in this area in Kiribati, in the Central Pacific. Uh, Kiribati recorded a 400% sustained improvements in revenues between 1985 and 1991. Lesotho recorded a 2,000% increase in revenues between 1992 and 1997, thanks mainly to the effective taxation of the Lesotho Highlands water project in those years. Rwanda recorded a 700% increase in revenues in the years 2002 to 2010. Burundi, where I currently work, has so far recorded an 86% sustainable increase in revenues between 2010 and 2013 over the 2009 base year. Burundi also recorded the lowest GDP per capita in current dollars according to the World Bank in 2012. So what did we do to stimulate these revenue increases? Here we see the various interlocking and mutually reinforcing strategy pillars that must be addressed in the kind of tax reforms to which I refer. These invariably involve modernizing the tax laws and tax procedures, addressing the human resources and governance issues, explaining what is happening and, crucially, why it is happening to the population, the taxpayers and, indeed, all stakeholders, creating the information technology platforms and the supporting infrastructure, 
even down to purchasing desks and chairs and making the required office renovations while promoting trade through greater regional integration, all with the ultimate aim of maximising revenues and delivering faster and better services. These reforms place the taxpayer at the centre of focus, creating a tax system that is as automatic and as investor and trade friendly as possible in order to achieve economic growth and combat poverty. We increase taxpayer compliance by segregating taxpayers into groups of large, medium and small and developing different compliance strategies for each in accordance with best international practices. We also increase compliance by developing greater reliance on withholding taxes, often final withholding taxes, broadening tax bases and reducing tax rates to the maximum extent possible. In the, in the tax administration, we develop strong human resources policies based on merit and transparency, along with strong information technology systems and capacity building, all predicated on the idea that revenue collection staff are professionals and must be treated and paid accordingly. We also design internal audit systems meant to fight corruption among staff and reward good work ethics. We attempt to facilitate trade at every possible opportunity through the creation of one-stop border posts, integrated border management, authorised economic operator schemes, and so on. Throughout all of this, we must remember that aid is a collaborative effort. A strong partnership between recipient governments and donors is essential for success, with agreed and common inputs and anticipated results. In addition, aid must be flexible and programmes must change according to the changing needs of the recipients. This essentially is the tax, trade and transparency agenda. Just to give you one example, in Burundi, improved OBR performance meant that domestic revenues provided almost 78% of domestically financed expenditure in 2013. And this was up from 63% in the year before the reforms were introduced in 2009. It's not hard to see the potential for this fragile state in the next five years, assuming, of course, a continuation of the same policies. In terms of tax policy, developing countries should explore the avenue of property tax, which is vastly underutilized in Africa. Implementing a property tax along with the relevant systems would be a way to bring in additional revenues, but also to address fraud and tax evasion through the reconciliation of taxpayers' revenue declarations with their real estate assets. Tax policy also needs to address the trade-offs between reducing the informal sector and maximizing revenues. When it comes to micro-taxpayers, experience shows that drawing them into the standard fiscal net may cost more than it brings in, hence the need to resort to proxy taxes for this group. Another pressing policy avenue is the removal of discretionary exemptions, which can be very high in African states. In Burundi, for example, the total fiscal losses due to exemptions in 2012 amounted to 141 billion Burundi francs, which is 4% of gross domestic product and almost 27% of total domestic revenues. Why do countries appear to resist tax reform, or at the very least, they often appear very slow to recognize its benefits? It's certainly the case that many countries have a complete lack of capacity as how to conduct such reforms, and they often have little or no capacity to define and make tax policy. Even the smallest countries require information technology systems, <clears throat> including the, the uh, the local technical capacity to run and maintain these systems, systems that alone, even without maintenance support, are often prohibitively expensive. Countries need to be able to think through the entire mechanism of taxpayer compliance, risk assessment and selective audits, and this is often contrary to current or previous ways of thinking. Proper tax collection brings with it accountability to taxpayers. I've noticed that many states tend to resist moving to an accountability role with their taxpayers, preferring to stay with the tried and trusted methods of granting discretionary tax exemptions to favoured, favoured taxpayers, often at enormous cost, whilst remaining as beneficiaries of aid. Although the elites should contribute substantially to state revenues, they often have no interest in consuming government services and thus in paying taxes, quite simply because they can purchase better services in the private sector. In those circumstances, state schools and hospitals can languish for want of funding while police and soldiers receive subsistence salaries. Meanwhile, 
Elites live in walled compounds with private security, consuming private medicine and schooling, and ignoring their tax responsibilities. We also have donor resistance to fiscal reform. Donors resist fiscal reform, reform but perhaps nowadays not so much as in the past. Donor-funded projects are invariably tax-free in recipient countries, and donors continually fail to appreciate the potential impact of fiscal reform on state finances. In Rwanda, DFID financed the Rwanda Revenue Authority over a 12-year period from 1998 to 2010, and at a cost of £24 million. At the conclusion of the support period, the RRA was collecting the equivalent of the entire DFID investment every two or three weeks in taxes. The RRA continues to perform exceptionally well today, and this, is clearly, this clearly is the gift that keeps on giving. There are very few private or public sector investments on the planet with that rate of return, and yet the OECD released a report in February this year which makes clear that only 0.07% of all aid is directed at building accountable tax systems in fragile states. <clears throat> Sorry, I missed that one. So, the way forward. Uh, how do we unlock the fiscal potential in developing countries? We need to recognise that aid is essentially a partnership. In all, in all successful partnerships, the partners each bring their own contribution to the business, and there is a shared expectation of a successful outcome. Recipient countries must be incentivized to comprehensively strengthen their tax systems whilst ensuring that tax exemptions are minimized. In turn, donors could and should agree to direct more aid funds towards strengthening domestic fiscal systems along the lines previously outlined. An expectation from both parties should be objectively set performance criteria along a range of measurable benchmarks to ensure that revenues grow in real terms with the expectation that countries could reach the tax to GDP ratio of 20% within a realistic time frame. Transfer pricing, transfer pricing is an issue in almost all the countries where I've worked, as is the general behavior, behavior of multinational corporations. I recall one multinational corporation that had negotiated a special 10% tax rate in a southern African country, telling the government that if their special status was revoked as part of its reform program, they would disinvest and move to Ireland, as they suggested to the government, and supply the African market from there. Even with their low tax rate, this company accounted for half the income tax receipts of the country, and their profitability was such that the payback period after investment in an entire new plant was four months. So it is no surprise that the government saw fit not to disturb their special status. A way to address transfer pricing and illicit flows in general is to encourage information sharing. Jurisdictions should be encouraged to exchange tax-relevant information on an automatic and multilateral basis, as opposed to the way it is done today, namely by agreement and bilaterally. Also, harmonised tax bases and rates across countries would be a way to reduce the incentive for tax avoidance for transnational companies. Finally, a solution could be that the international tax rules be changed so that multinational corporations are obliged to file combined reports on a country-by-country -country basis. These solutions may be easier to implement through regional agreements like the East African community, for example. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I think we all agree that taxation is central to economic development and that the gains from growing the tax base far outweigh other possible income flows, such as international development assistance. Taxation also strengthens the social contract between the citizen and the state and drives accountability and transparency. If we are indeed serious about economic development, we need to find a means of providing the tools necessary to help the most impoverished countries move out of poverty by themselves growing their own tax bases. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Let's, let's move straight on to Tim Besley. I, I've asked myself with this. 
Uh, so thank, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. And I, I, I can't resist on an occasion such as this to pay tribute to my, my chair, who was my earliest teacher in economics, actually. I, uh, when we were even younger than we are today, Paul, I first met you. Uh, and he was the person who interviewed me for admission to university. And you'll have to judge whether he made a mistake or not. I did get in. Um, but actually, I was also there at, at Oxford when the, uh, Paul first started uh, what was then called the unit for the study of African economies became the center and this wonderful conference is a, a, a product of that very long run investment and I think Paul uh, needs to uh, uh, receive the deserved credit for what he's created here. Now I'm going to talk today about uh, uh, thoughts on, on state capacity, um, some, a topic I've, I've thought about a little bit um, and uh, I want to make really um, three, uh, three comments. Um, so I want to begin talking about fiscal capacity uh, in particular, which is what our previous speaker was really talking about, because I tend to prefer to use the term state capacity to refer to a broader agenda and, and the term fiscal capacity to refer particularly to the ability of the state to raise tax revenues. Then I want to uh, uh, discuss why I think it's important to, to embed our understanding of fiscal capacity in a wider understanding of state capacity. And then I want to talk about the symptoms or causes, and I, I, you'll see what I, I'm going to talk about when I, when I get to that point. Okay, so um, I, think, I think when we think about fiscal capacity, of course, the first order issue is we want to increase revenues. Um, but it's important to realize that, the, the, that what we tend, the, the levers we tend to have available to us are not, if you, if you look at the debates, and I've been involved in a lot of debates about tax reforms in developed countries, it's generally about um, um, changing rates or, uh, but the, 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 bigger, the bigger issue uh, is how to expand and to, uh, a, a, and, and to access tax bases that perhaps weren't previously available. So if you look at uh, debates about the scope of the, uh, of the VAT um, and the uh, extent of the reach of the income tax, they're far more important, I think, relative to debates about rates, although so rates are important. The, the, the base uh, is really what we tend to focus on. Um, the, other, the other sort of broad issue around fiscal capacity is, is to reduce reliance on other, what I would call particularly inefficient forms of revenue. So uh, reliance on trade taxes, seigniorage uh, would be two examples. Now the following uh, picture, it, it kind of captures in a little bit what we see if we look across countries, and this is about as crude as we can get, but it's kind of interesting uh, to, to look at these two, uh, two panels for what they, what they say. What I've done is I've plotted um, for the year, well, it's 1999 from IMF data, um, the share of income taxes in total taxes across countries against the share of trade taxes. And what you see, perhaps not so surprisingly, is that the countries... Um, that, uh, that have very high shares of income taxes uh, also uh, tend to have very low shares of uh, trade taxes. So that line is negatively sloped because I think what we see in the process of development is a shift from the bottom right-hand corner, roughly speaking, of the first panel to the top left. And uh, that process is highly correlated with income. So by the time you get to the richer countries in the, in the world, not surprisingly, they've almost entirely dispensed with trade taxes as a source of revenue. Partly because if you're going to be a member of the EU, you can not rely, except on, to the extent there's a common external tariff, you can't rely on trade tax revenues any longer. Um, so what we see is a kind of general shift, not just in the level of tax revenue raised, but also the composition. Um, and uh, generally speaking, that correlates fairly well with income. Now, what, this is, this, these two panels are from a, uh, a, a, a survey chapter that Torsten Persson and I just published in the Handbook of, uh, of Public Economics. And what we did for that was to go back to some historical sources. There's a, a well-known project by Mitchell that looks at historical tax, uh, tax information. And it turns out we could match reasonably well for a sample of countries what the historical picture looks like for the 20th century. And what's rather striking is that if you plot um, the set of countries for which we could get consistent data, the red dots in the right-hand panel are the period 1970 to 1999, uh, uh, and the blue dots are the earliest period, 1900 to 1940. And very much the picture looks kind of quite parallel for the time series evidence as it does for the modern-day cross-sectional evidence. Of course, there's much more dispersion in the cross-section than the, 
the time series. And in fact, one thing we found, which was sort of interesting looking at Mitchell's data, which is, I think, the best data we have available for public finance statistics for the 20th century, is actually the patterns in the time series look really rather similar to the patterns in the cross-section. So actually, if you look at where developing countries are today, they're not very differently placed in terms of the proportion of revenues they raise in GDP to the now developed countries were at the time when they had comparable income levels as the current developed world, uh, developing world. So actually there's nothing, if you just say benchmark it against income and development in general, there's nothing anomalous or very little that's anomalous about the current state of affairs within uh, within developing countries. And that comes out quite strongly when you compare the historical statistics with the contemporaneous. So whatever, what does that make me think? Well, whatever process is going on generating fiscal capacity over time, it's part and parcel of the general process of economic development. And that general process, at the end of the day, is what we have to think about when we think about um, uh, why states are, are doing poorly in, 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 in generating tax revenues. Now, how do we go about actually measuring fiscal capacity? Um, the IMF is doing quite a lot of work on this now, and I'm trying to persuade them to do something more systematic. They've done a lot of work on tax gaps, which has been influential in policy, but mainly for developed countries. So actually, if you go to our HMRC here, they actually know exactly what the tax gap is that's been identified by the OECD, uh, by the IMF for the UK. Um, what they haven't done is generate that kind of information um, essentially, what's the tax gap? The tax gap is sort of where you would expect to be for various tax bases if you only enforce compliance and uh, for, given the rates you're charging and the amount of revenue you're, you're actually generating. And uh, these, these are quite a nice way of thinking about both the levels of revenue you're generating and the level of revenues you'd expect to generate if you could close loopholes and you could administer the system appropriately. Now, this is a kind of project that I think has, has some way to run, and the Fiscal Affairs Department of the, of the IMF, I think, is committed to doing more work of this kind, particularly extending it and rolling it out to, um, to, to developing countries. The, the, within the Doing Business project, as many of you will be aware, there was an attempt to do stuff on, on taxation within that project. But in fact, there's very little done on a sort of international benchmarking basis, and I think there's a lot more that could be done to try and point out where different countries are faring in relation to what would be reasonable benchmark countries for different kinds of tax bases. Because otherwise, we're left to fall back on really very crude indicators of fiscal capacity. The one I think that's probably a catch-all, that's quite a reasonable number to look at across countries, is the share of income tax in total taxes. Uh, as a kind of measure of the, of the development of the fiscal system, but it's highly imperfect. And I think it's an area where we need a lot of better data for the basis of doing international benchmarking and thinking of the consequences of that. Um, another area I think which is kind of interesting and, and is really taking off in research terms is what I call the microeconomics of fiscal capacity. And a lot of what I, that Kieran talked about in his presentation, I would put in the category of the microeconomics of fiscal capacity, actually looking at the kinds of measures that we have available to us to really transform the way the system works. Now, one approach to this, which has been quite popular, um, and, and there's some interesting research going on, is to look at incentives, particularly incentives among tax administrators. To what extent can you um, reduce corruption in the tax system? Can you in induce greater effort among tax administrators? And there's some work that the International Growth Center has done in Pakistan, which is actually based explicitly on a field experiment to try and incentivize tax collectors to look at what kinds of yields you get by changing incentive schemes. So there's a lot of scope uh, there. But the area I think that, that hasn't been uh, looked at so much, but people are beginning to look at, are what you might call looking, uh, social norms and the impact of social norms on tax collection. So Raj Chetty, again, has a project um, through the International Growth Center in Pakistan where they're trying to publicize um, the amount of tax that different taxpayers pay to try and generate a culture in which people um, actually want to comply because they know um, that others are going to find out whether they've complied with their taxes. So you might go to a, situa to go to a, uh, to, to a, to a particular place, a place of work or a village or whatever, and, uh, and actually publicize um, the amount of tax that different people have paid. I, I'm told it's true, I don't know if there's anyone here from Norway, that in Norway you can actually go on the web and you can look at your tax return of your neighbor. 
Uh, of course, we kind of assume that's going to be good for tax compliance, but you could actually imagine it going either way. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is that these, these kinds of norm-creating activities are something that economists have tended to, in the past, shy away from. But I think they're, pre they're pretty important and are the focus of in increasing research among, among economists. And let me give you a little example from, from, a, from a project from, a, from, from the UK that I, I've just... This is a paper that we just, just wrote. It's something I was curious about for a long time, and this is the answer to something uh, that I thought about. So I don't know if anyone knows, but there was a serious effort in the UK to destroy fiscal capacity. Uh, and that was when Margaret Thatcher introduced something called the poll tax. So the poll tax, which it, the, the Tory government in the, in the late 1980s had the bright idea to change um, taxation of, of local government by replacing the property tax with a tax that was literally the same for everybody. Um, and there was a mass, massive protest. Um, and uh, what this shows you here are the three periods. Before the poll tax, during the poll tax, this is the proportion of people who didn't pay their poll tax. So as you can see, um, among the high non-complying uh, areas, 20% of people, you know, the British have been a pretty law-abiding it was England and Wales, I should say. Actually, and Scotland had it too. So less than 5% of the population were not paying their taxes. They introduced the poll tax, and suddenly that leaps to 20% in many areas. And that was because people deemed it to be unfair. But the question we want to know the answer to was, was there a long-run impact? Because what they did, they gave up on the poll tax. They actually abolished the tax and decided to return to a system of property taxation. So we want to ask the question, were the areas where the high poll tax non-compliance took place, persistently high non-compliance after the tax had been abolished. Was there a kind of social norms effect? Because after this, you couldn't argue it was anything other than social norms that were driving high levels of non-compliance. And what you see is pretty much until 2010, that's the red line, the areas that had high non-compliance during the poll tax period had high non-compliance. There's some convergence. But notice in the period before the poll tax, Absolutely, those two lines lie on top of each other. So it looks as if something happened, which we attribute to social norms, and we, we produce more evidence in the paper, that it is a social norms effect. And then it's a very slow decaying effect. So it tells us two things that we believe about norms. Norms are hard to shift, when you, particularly when you get bad norms. They're hard to shift. They're not impossible to shift. You can use compliance and other, uh, other ways to do it. But that then there's a very slow process of convergence associated with norms. So I just view this as a sort of illustration of the basic argument that we should be focusing in on this much more than the literature, I think, has previously. And this is just one example. But I think it's a nice, close to natural experiment because it's based on this particular tax that was introduced into a relatively law-abiding uh, country. Let me talk now about the scope of state capacity. Um, so, so I love this quote, I overuse it, um, by, by Schumpeter um, uh, from a, a really interesting article which I, I encourage anyone who's interested in this to read, um, called The Crisis of the Tax State. The thing you have to remember about this article, it was written in 19, uh, well, 1917, at a time when most developed countries were raising of the order of 10% of GDP in taxes. So they were like Burundi today. I mean, essentially, most of the rich countries of, of the world in 1910, 1920 were raising about that same proportion. And Schumpeter writes this essay saying these are unsustainably high levels of taxation um, because, of course, they had increased significantly in the previous period. And that's why he writes The Crisis of the Tax State. Um, and he writes this essay which basically says, how is it that a government can raise as much revenue as 10% of GDP? Because at that point, it was historically unprecedented. Uh, and, and, he, and he says the following, the fiscal history of a people is above all an essential part of its general history, and that's what I want to come to in a minute, an enormous influence on the fate of nations, and I love this phrase, emanates from the economic bleeding which the needs of the state necessitates and from the use to which uh, the results are put. And I think in a nutshell, everything is here. Everything we think now about long-run determination of fiscal capacity is here. In other words, he's saying you cannot separate out fiscal capacity from thinking about the general forces that drive state development. It's right at the heart of it, but it's much more than that. And that's why I introduce it in the context of, a, of the scope of state capacity. So sure enough, I think state capacity has three broad elements. And I think they're intrinsically linked. And I think it's quite problematic to, to study them independently. 
Um, now, that's not to say we should just have sort of integrated economics that studies everything at once, but I do think there's a general, there's a real cost to hiding off particular dimensions and, and not uh, thinking about why they, these three things are joined up. So first is fiscal capacity, the ability of the state to command uh, taxes uh, one way or another. The second um, is, is a central role of the state in providing infrastructure. Um, and I talk, tend to talk about soft and hard infrastructure. Traditionally, um, we, we, we probably spent too much time talking about what I would call hard infrastructure, roads, bridges and ports and so forth, which are pretty important, don't get me wrong. But actually, uh, the sort of more recently we've realized that soft infrastructure, courts, contracting institutions, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, are much more, and, and the operation of the legal system are much more important, or not much more important, but equally important to hard infrastructure. And how we get effective institutions to deliver those is, is probably just as important as building, uh, building hard infrastructure. And then finally, the collective provision of goods and services. And of course, when the history of the 20th century is written, and I'm sure someone's, someone's written it already, but I think one of the central, central facts about the 20th century that we shouldn't forget is that fact that Schumpeter was drawing our attention to, that by the, at the beginning, of the, um, the beginning of the 20th century, around 10% of GDP was the norm in tax collection. By the end of the 20th century, a group of countries, not every country around the world, the rich countries of the world, were raising well in excess of 40% of GDP in the form of taxation. That's a dramatic transformation. And why is that? Well, they're providing a lot more collective uh, provision of goods and services. So it's, a, it's clearly based on, on, on that. But that is a, that, that, that one, one can't unhinge the process of creating fiscal capacity from the process of generating demands from the pro collective provision of goods and services and providing infrastructure. Now, if you, if you try and crudely measure, and I emphasize this is, this is quite crude, but I was kind of proud of my ability to create a three-dimensional graphic, so I'm going to show it to you anyway. So, so I tell you, for someone with my computer skills, this is like rocket science. Anyway, um, so, so basically what this is, is a, a, my, my attempt to draw a three-dimensional picture of, of three dimensions of, of state capacity. So on, on the... Uh, on the um, Horizontal dimension is a measure of fiscal capacity, which is the share of income taxes and total taxes. On the uh, vertical axis is a measure of legal capacity, which is derived from the World Bank's Doing Business project. But I could have, I have different versions of that, and they all look fairly similar. And then, uh, and then on the uh, sort of axis moving away from you there is, the, is a measure of what we call collective capacity, which is based on educational attainment and life expectancy. So it's a bit like the at the HDI measure with income extracted. And the one thing I want you to observe is that in pretty much all, there are, there are exceptions, and it's interesting to go to some of the outliers and figure out who they are and why they're there. But the bottom line is, again, I've colored the dots by low-income countries, blue. Um, uh, the hollow dots are the, the middle-income countries, and the red dots are the high-income countries. And you see that these different dimensions of, of state capacity are correlated, positively correlated with each other on the whole, um, and strongly correlated with income. So it tells me when I want to think about these issues, I've got to think about the kind of bigger questions of, of what it is that means that states, uh, states develop at different rates and they build these fiscal capacities, they build, build these um, infrastructure capacities, and they build uh, collective capacities. And this, there's some set of driving forces that we need to think about in the relation to all of them. So I've written this book with, with Torsten Persson where we kind of tried to, to, look, to look at this. And, and, and I think that the thing we try to get over in there, and I, what I wanted to say today, is I think it, it's a kind of mistake to think of the causality running either from state capacity um, to, uh, to income and to other, other things, or vice versa that there's a series of quite complex interdependent causal channels here. And anyone who wants to reduce it to some simplistic uh, causal channel is probably going to get things quite badly wrong. But we think there are sort of three broad sets of influences that are worthy of study, um, which we are called so the exogenous and historically externally determined conditions. Um, and there's a huge amount of research on this. I'm, uh, in the five minutes I've got left, I'm not going to really get, it, get into that, but I'll give you some examples. Of, of areas where I think we've really learned something in that debate. Political institutions and the way they shape incentives. And then finally, complementarities, because I don't think you can tell the story of state capacities unless you think hard about the forms of complementarity. 
So a word or two on that. Before I do that, this is my, another diagram I want to boast about because I call this my business school diagram. I figure if I was teaching in a business school, this is, I'd have diagrams like this all the time. Um, but unfortunately, I don't, so I don't. But uh, here you are. This is, this is the, the business school diagram that explains um, uh, um, uh, uh, state capacity in one slide. Um, essentially, what we try to do is, and this just summarizes our book for anyone who wants to, to read it. There's actually an article, uh, shameless advertising, coming out in the annual reviews, which really develops this whole framework, just in a sort of bite-sized piece. Um, but the, whole, the thing I want you to take away from here is you can think of there being different channels of influence, um, the ro role of political institutions, I'll talk briefly in a minute about cohesiveness and stability, the role of factors such as resource and aid dependence and, and the nature of underlying cleavages, and then finally this sort of circle between income, income per capita and, and the growth of state capacity and the way that all works. Now, I'm not going to have time to unpack this, but the one thing I think we've learned a lot about and we're learning quite a bit about is um, that, the, 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 the ex that relatively exogenous historically determined factors appear to have very long-run influences on not just patterns of development but also subsequent patterns of state capacity. And you know, there's been a lot written on this, the role of colonialism, culture, the long-run uh, effects of slavery and fragmentation and other things. This is a kind of big area where the, the, if the mark of history is left very often on the kinds of patterns that we see. Unfortunately, I don't have time to, to talk any more, but you'll be familiar with the sort of explosion of literature in this area that, that tells us that these things are a significant part of the background factors which drive the subsequent patterns of development and the subsequent nature of, uh, of, of, of the way the state evolved in particular in, in different places. I want to talk briefly before I finish though about political institutions because I want to make, make two points really. Um, uh, one is that I think it's really unhelpful and, and I, I'm, I've been guilty in the past so it's like kind of reformed sinners. Um, but uh, I, I think we should just expunge discussion of the word democracy and development from our discourse. It's just too dangerous and imprecise and unhelpful. I think we need to be clear about the nature of the, that doesn't mean that the institutional features which different systems of government have are not incredibly important. But I think it's very, very important to distinguish two aspects in particular of the nature of political institutions. And those are institutions for acquiring power, so do you hold elections? On what terms are they held? These are very important. And the other is institutions for holding power. Are you subject to constraints? And if so, what kinds of constraints are you subject to? Now, if you score, it turns out, highly enough on some combination of these dimensions, you can get yourself classified as a democracy um, in, the, in, in normal classification of those things. But there's way too much obsession on institutions for acquiring power, which is holding elections, and way too little, in my opinion, um, focus on institutions for holding power. And this is very important because, th uh, th for me, accountability, which lies fundamentally behind building state capacity, typically lies in institutions and the constraints on holding power. Um, the, in the, the nature of the political equilibrium that you get when you look at the way political institutions particularly interact with these historical factors, I think is the first order determinant of the nature of the states that emerge and how those states subsequently fare in building state capacity. And I think the core dimension, and I think I've, um, Kieran sort of focused on it but used a slightly different way of thinking about it, but the core dimension is the extent to which you can build a state which is predominantly focused on serving collective versus private interests. So when you talked about elites and the elites exiting or being apart from the state, that's the most unpropitious circumstance into which you can build an effective state of any kind, be it a fiscal state, a state that functions in terms of collective provision. So, so the, the, core, the core thing to study, I think, if you're going to study the determinants of, of state capacity, is how you can build a state that shifts its predominant focus to being run on the basis of private interests to being run on the basis of collective interests. I'm not going to have time to talk about it. It's a partly a shift of institutions, but it's also very significantly a shift of, of social norms and the way the elites view their obligations in relation to the citizens, which you can achieve to a point by reforming institutions, but I would argue is not entirely a, 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 folk, a, a product of institutions.
What Torsten and I like to talk in terms of in our work is how do you build a common interest state? Now, of course, when you're working with a Swede, it's very easy to sort of think of an ideal type, namely it's Sweden. You know, at some level, it's a remarkable thing, like Sweden exists. You know, it actually does exist, and it does things, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a place that has built a state predominantly around serving collective interests. And you want to unpack that. Is it social norms? Is it because Sweden built a particular con constellation of institutions that embedded those norms? Um, you know, when you want to understand, uh, understand that, then you begin to get to the heart of how we can build effective, effective states. Um, and presumably, in an effective state, it's more likely, well, it is more likely that good ideas find their way into policy. If you evaluate policies, policies appear to be doing what you want them to do, then they're more likely to get adopted. And equally, in those kind of states, you don't have to worry so much about political instability. Um, because effectively, you've got, an, you've got a, a structure in place that can cope with political instability. Um, uh, so, so effectively, uh, common interest states uh, are what we're trying to build, and I would argue that such states are the precondition for building fiscal, legal, and, um, and collective capacity. The selective interest state is the alternative. Unfortunately, most of the world, in one way or another, is run by selective interest states. They work more or less badly, depending on the structures in place. It's not like all selective interest states. So, you know, China, at least on some dimensions, is doing perfectly well, but is not a common interest state, I would argue. And there's lots of reasons, and I've even written a paper on that using this framework, so I don't have time to go into that. But it is not a, not a common interest state. Okay, so the big question, if you're going to study these issues, is what factors can we understand? Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about this finally. Um, uh, I, I think at the end of the day, if we're going to study state capacity, um, it's fine to study it as a separate topic, but I've come to believe it's so central to the way we think about development. When we study state capacity, we're just studying development. Because at the end of the day, the, the big story about development is not actually the development of markets. Markets can more or less take care of themselves, provided they work within a structure of support. Where does that structure of support come from? It comes from the state. Markets work well if states cooperate with markets. They work poorly if you know, there's no entry, if people can rip each other off. So markets, really, we don't, we're not directly taking care, care of markets at some, at some level. So I think, you know, some, if we're going to study state capacity, we're really studying development. Uh, I won't go as far as to, I'm having my sort of Milton Friedman moment. You know the famous quote by um, Bob Solo, who said when Milton Friedman um, uh, sees anything, he thinks of money. He said, and Bob Solo said, when I see anything, I think of sex, but at least I don't tell people. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I'm getting to be sort of like, whenever I see something, I think of state capacity. And uh, so I'm kind of having my uh, Milton Friedman moment there. But to some extent, I do think actually at the heart of development is the very question, why is it that some countries have acquired state institutions that do not work in a way that's, um, that, 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 that is uh, uh, leaning against the possibility of progress for, um, for economic development. What's the role of research um, in, in all of this? I, I view it as now, so the, you know, I've been only working on this for a fairly short period. I think it's understanding the mechanisms. That's what we need to do. It's not enough to, you know, there's no reduced form regression, nothing you can show me that's gonna be helpful to, to unpacking it, unless I can understand the mechanism behind all this. So what Torsten and try, I try and do in our business school diagram, uh, but do it sort of in the usual way economists do it. We have models and, and we try and formalize hypotheses about different mechanisms. We think the essence of it is to try and understand what those mechanisms are and what the empirical strength of those mechanisms is. What's really hard is I don't think it's about, I mean, I used to have a kind of institutional kick on all of this, meaning that, you know, I, I, you know Darren Asimogo and Jim Robinson, two of my best friends, uh, and, uh, you know, I love their book, but, you know, I think they've just gone overboard in the whole kind of it's all about institutions story. I think it's a really, really uh, uh, important to, to, to think about the, the relative importance of culture and institutions. So I'm on a kind of culture kick at the moment, but I do think it's important the norms and culture, the way they interact with institutions is the big research question. Because I don't believe that by studying institutions alone without that interact. And we can study that in micro data and macro data. But I think economists probably did the wrong thing when they decided they wanted to leave that behind. Um, 
What role for external intervention? Um, I don't think we should view these as technical problems. These, these are about studying problems that are much more deeply embedded in the political and economic systems of countries than pure technical solutions would ever suggest. Um, so the really tough question, which I know Stefan is about to answer, is how do you actually embed policy in a way that can make progress in this, rather than believing that you're going to sort of roll up and shift a whole political social equilibrium by, um, by uh, um, pointing out what's a great idea in this context. It's really much more embedded than that. So apologies, I went on a little too long, but uh, thank you very much. I think so. Is on? Okay. Um, good. Um, what I would like to talk a little bit about is, is, is trying to actually, you know, trying to follow um, what Tim has been talking about to some extent. And in fact, you'll see that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to use to some extent in a very simplistic way some of the kind of framing that, that Tim has been referring to. Um, but see how we actually try to do some of these things in practice in a, in a different context. Okay, so um, for us, you know, we, we're dealing typically with people who want to do practical things. They want to do something, you know, and, and we, um, it's actually rare that we have people like Kieran who both do things but actually reflect on it as well. So you kind of, there's the, inter the intervention side. At the same time, you know, as DFID, you know, um, especially on the topic of state capacity, I have to recognize, you know, I'm, I am the state now as well. I'm dealing within, with civil servants. I am a civil servant. I am dealing with uh, political masters. And we need to be able to articulate some of these more complicated ideas to actually see whether they can actually, can actually drive some sensible things. So what I will be presenting will come across possibly, arguably quite simplistic, uh, but it's the important thing. You know, when we're talking to policymakers, we can't talk evidence. Actually, they don't really quite get it. You need to actually try to tell them narratives, stories, ways of thinking that are based on the evidence. And the main thing is that you have to make sure that the others who just tell stories are not just telling the stories, but actually that you build it on something that's reasonable, sensible, and building on the kind of evidence. So this is actually kind of an attempt to, in some of the work we're doing, um, and we had a window of opportunity to actually trying to talk a little bit more in, in the last, say, 12 months on some of these issues. Okay, and then actually there's a surprisingly close link to what both Kieran and Tim has uh, been uh, dealing with. You know, we, in government we call this being joined up, but uh, it's all coincidence actually, as typically in government as well. Um, and it's actually, let me actually start, because this has actually been part of a process we've been, call it a bit of a dialogue with our ministers. Our Secretary of State and our ministers, they determine in the end everything. Or put it differently, the framing that we need to present at some point they need to kind of approve. So this is a bit of the framing how we started talking on some of these issues with them in the last 12 months. And it starts a little bit of, you know, we had a Secretary of State who came into office that's now about 18 months ago. Uh, with no understanding at all of development. So you had to kind of talk a little bit about some of the things. And these are a couple of things we were trying to bring across to her. A few things that she had picked up, you know, all, lots of these poor people, which is a typical concern for, 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 for DFID, they are living in all these middle-income countries. So a, and that's actually true, you know, two-thirds of the world's extreme poor, they now live in middle-income countries. But actually, um, of course, it's a lot to do with countries you see on the, on the right panel there, you know, countries like India with a huge stock of poverty, also the Nigerias, the Chinas, Indonesia, you know, fast countries still with quite a big stock. But what we wanted to zoom in uh, with her as well is to actually say, well, it's actually quite a striking thing. If you look at the low rent of the, the picture, um, you see actually that, you know, um, once it comes to low income countries, an awful lot of these places are fragile. I'm not even going to try to define it because we can argue forever about how we define fragility. But we're going to show you whatever kind of def definition we get is that we get increasingly poverty when it's poorer countries. They are obviously quite difficult places, complicated places, things that are actually not functioning that well. Okay, and while actually those who are becoming lower middle income countries, 
even though they have lots of big stocks, they actually are typically on, 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 on uh, not anymore with this, this kind of features. That's quite important because we want to bring across something that there's quite a lot of these countries that are middle-income countries with a lot of poverty. They are in a very different trajectory dynamically than the countries we should be typically concerned with. I'll come back to that in a moment. Indeed, so if you look at you know, the evolution of poverty in the world, it's again the framing we want to, 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 to bring across. You know, we have a beautiful red line on top, which is the decline in global poverty, the observed one. Uh, of course, if you put China there, then you kind of see that actually we've achieved stagnation of the number of people poor in the world by achieving the MDGs, but that's another, uh, another matter. Um, but it's going down, but it's actually looking forward. What are the trajectories we are on? And actually, of course, it's all going to be depend. depend. If we believe that whole of Africa suddenly will become like China, as there's some papers, in fact, Martin Valley has a paper that seems to imply this, if, it all, if everybody becomes like China, if we get the curvatures in the poverty reduction, will be fine. We don't have to worry too much about Africa and there's nothing going to happen. Although, if we go on the patterns of the way at the moment these countries are, uh, are, are reducing poverty and on the way it's, it's happening, even accelerating growth, we're not going to see that awful lot going on and we'll probably more in a stagnating poverty kind of picture. So that's important, but from my, for, the, for what I want to focus on or zoom in on about is that actually, if we do projections, we have scenario analysis, we do, and of course this old crystal ball gazing, try to give a sense of supposed current patterns are continuing, where are we going to go with poverty? Well, basically we'll get much more concentration of poverty in fragile places, because the green areas, they are the kind of non-fragile countries, they're their own trajectories that are going down, and we should really be concerned with some of these places where there seems to be very little going on, and poverty will be hardest to reduce in states that are currently classified as fragile, conflict-ridden, and, and or with, with poor governance. And in fact, that's actually places where there's very little going on. Okay? So, of course, if we can start changing something there in these places, we can make progress. So, what is different in this respect? You know, just for those who have actually a little clue about what we're really doing, you know, we are a government department. We have a Secretary of State who sits in Cabinet, he sits in, uh, can make decisions on the UK in general, but basically we're a grant-giving body and it's quite a lot of money we spend, in $15 billion a year. That's quite a, quite a decent sum uh, to try to spend. We have actually, by law, a commitment to actually focus on poverty reduction. There's an International Development Act that actually says we should focus on these things. And we get framed, we have all kinds of frames around it, for fighting for the MDGs or, and so on. But the important thing for the things I want to continue now with, it's all not just all, all about, about aid. Okay, so we get often the impression is created, this is all just spending, but surely there's quite a recognition that it's not just all about um, it. So we went through a period of rethinking where our Secretary of State wants to ask us these big questions. Do we do the right things? Do we do it in the right places in the right way? So I won't say much about the right places in the right way, except for we've actually now have a more dynamic focus on it and say, you know, well, we look at countries where at current patterns, what's going on, the way the state operates, the way growth operates, the way poverty gets reduced, where the prospects for the poor are actually pretty weak and pretty grim, these are the places we want to, to focus on. This includes lots of fragile places, okay? Let me talk a little bit about the right things here. So, okay, so then, and that actually is the thing we try to talk a little bit about it, you know? No, the big man. Um, he's our, you know, our prime minister, um, and actually, he's been extremely helpful for us in these kind of agendas, the kind of things that Tim and Kieran has been talking about. So, um, he's a surprisingly um, big supporter. Well, he's a big fan of uh, of Paul Collier's work, and he's a big supporter of uh, of a development agenda, um, and you know, and he's been talking about something unfortunately called a little bit a strange concept, golden threat of development, but basically it is about uh, make, making sure we can actually have a narrative around DFID very strongly on economic, political, institutional building blocks for development. Okay, so getting a, a clear agenda that is not just about spending aid, but actually thinking a bit more about some other things. So, you know, and that internationally that has been reflected in things uh, Paul has been quite involved in a G8 agenda, or in fact shaped shaped it on all things to do international tax transparency and uh, trade and um, in all kinds of agendas, basically, on the international front. Um, but here I'll focus a little bit 
uh, where, where it got us to. And in fact, this gave us the wind of opportunity to actually talk about Tim's book um, uh, and to actually to try to use it. We also used it to talk about, you know, uh, another book that then, uh, was put forward and put slightly differently. We kind of offered these two books as the intellectual foundations for David Cameron was talking about. Politicians like kind of a clear framing of some of the things they have and, and, um, and, and I'm risking here all the time getting in trouble, but um, actually if you have a, in political statements, you often get a lot of nouns. So actually these books may well help us or these at least this background behind it, create some grammar between the nouns of how these things actually function together. And that's actually the language we're using. Well, this is as kind of the grammar behind thinking about some of these ways these things are linked. Um, I must say that you know both of these uh, we've written internally a bit about these books, and I, I'm pretty sure it reached uh, uh, the prime minister as well. Although I must say he prefers this book. Uh, he calls this now his favourite book. Uh, he gives in newspaper interviews, and he says that's my favourite book. But okay, that's that's uh, you know that's kind of pretty useful in terms of saying you have a foundation. So, but. How do we then embed this further in our actual work? So you have a window of opportunity to work on things to do with the institutional foundations of development. How do you build this then actually further in? So what we've been trying to do in terms of the language about doing the right things when we work in countries, we actually try to develop some, some kind of sensible diagnostics based on some of what is, uh, what is this being, being talking about. Of course, you all know about, you know, uh, growth diagnostics, but actually growth diagnostics are a real technocratic uh, approach to development. They really want to calculate effectively some shadow prices and so on. I had a, a rather bizarre conversation at some point in USA who kept on asking after they saw some of the rest of the slides, or what are where your structural equations that you then were estimating and how, which ones did you treat as endogenous and exogenous and say, well, no, no, this is about framing and thinking rather than actually having concrete kind of stuff. And so this is actually the way now these days that we hear our Secretary of State talking about it, is that actually it's what DIFFI does. What is DIFFI doing now? We're striving for, we're promoting a secure, timely, self financed exit from, from, uh, from poverty for poor countries. Okay, so it's quite important, you know, the self-finance is there, the timeliness, the secure thing, but it's actually, we want to achieve it. We're not saying we are going to do it, we, we're striving for it. And we want to actually get this kind of, what can we do in this respect? And trying to get an eight agenda that has a more institutional basis in the way we work. Trying to, in fact, we try to develop some diagnostics, and I'll give you some examples of that, where we try to get an integration of the economics of it all, but with the politics. And actually, if it's one thing we've tried to achieve, is that all our political scientists, all our governance advisors, the, big, the biggest cadre in DFID, uh, to actually work closely with the economists and actually together do diagnostic work in countries on a whole series of things there. And basically, it's about, um, we were encouraged also by our Secretary of State to investigate, you know, t um, because she, her concern was, tell me where I should spend my money, but it should be really on things that make a difference, language. So actually finding, can we actually get some of the bottlenecks, the key barriers, uh, sorry, there's a bit of a, a cut and paste error there going on, but the key barriers to a secure time is self-financed exit from poverty. Now, you know, look, the evidence based country by country, of course it's incomplete, but what you want to do is at least using a conceptual framework that talks about some of these things, to actually make sure we make sure that we try to think and carefully do, uh, act in that kind of space. It's also important here, diagnosis is not enough. You know, if we're pure technocrats, we think we'll fix it as well. And in fact, one of the big problems with aid agencies, they diagnose and then behave as if they can fix it. You know, there are lots of things we can't fix in these places. In fact, I was recently asked to calculate the cost of reaching the MDGs, and my answer was infinity. Um, and that's actually, I think, um, um, yeah, um, gosh, I was going to send, add a sentence here, which is, I probably can't act because I wasn't allowed to talk about it in public, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, the, um, but, the, but it's all about, you know, where we want to kind of have a clear sense of the space to act in a dynamic sense. So not just quick wins here and there, but thinking what they do in that country. To give a very concrete example, we may be 10 things that we would want to do. One was really maybe we can do, but we have to ask the question, does it make it less likely that the nine others ever can be done? And there are things sometimes when you do reforms 
For example, if you put up too early your safety net policies, that actually you may never be able to then remove the energy subsidies anyway. While in fact, if you could say, let's link the energy subsidy removal with the safety net policy, you may well be able to achieve something there, and so on and so on. So you want to think a bit about it. You do scenario analysis, including on political economy. And with an increased focus, which I'll come to that, worried about time now, on this kind of self-financing development, which is a big theme that DFID now wants to actually st more strongly focus on. Also, our Secretary of State is very committed to that. So what we do, we ask actually all our country offices, and in fact, within a very short period, in fact, in a four-month period, we ask everybody in our office to focus on answering these kind of questions, to actually really getting a sense of what is the task of poverty reduction in your country, what do you think are, are, uh, what is, what are the real barriers to get uh, self-finance timely secure exit from poverty in these countries? And we encourage them to think about seven areas. And I'll show you a little bit how we play around with them. One is, and, uh, you know, and, we, and I'll later on have nice business school diagrams as well. Uh, one is essentially you know, on this idea of what is the nature of the political settlement in the place? What is the way that the political settlement, the way the elite bargains and also in the rest of the society, how it interacts on these things? And asking actually very narrowly. We are deeply concerned with poverty reduction, with growth and, uh, and growth as the real theory of change to achieve poverty reduction. We want to ask, to what extent is the political settlement in this country conducive to poverty and growth? Poverty reduction and growth. Okay, to what extent uh, is it conducive to actually lead to more inclusiveness in society as well. Of course, if you have conflict, fundamentally, it's definitely one of these barriers. What is the situation in that respect? But also, score state capabilities, which is the ability, um, the ability to which the state can deliver these core functions, several of the things that were talked about um, earlier, but also the kind of a very important element, the willing element, which is the willingness of the state to act. Often it's not just the capacity, the ability to act, but it's the state organized in the ways it's willing to. So look into the way the civil service work, the way it interacts with the bureaucracy, so the bureaucracy interacts with the state, with the political and uh, politics and so on. We think in a lot of countries there is actually state cap cap capacity, but there's actually not a fundamental organization of the norms and the principles to get actually delivery of, of outcomes. Growth environment, you can read there the things we have, growth transmission, the fundamentals of uh, the social policy and service delivery, the collective goods that need to be delivered, and also fundamentally being able to deal forward-looking with uh, resilience to all kinds of things. And this is a picture we've been using to our political with our political masters, also in all our offices. And actually, it wants to say, in a way, what Tim was talking about, we have to understand that we can't just isolate one little bit, and that's the only thing you do. You try to actually get some. This is, so this is not deep science. This is actually just really simplistic, trying to represent a way of thinking about it. Simply saying that the end poverty reduction, if you start on the right of the picture, can, be, uh, can mean all kinds of things. It can uh, be obtained by delivery of jobs and incomes and so on, also by basic services on the bottom of the picture. There is a clearly a line there above which is to do with the function of the economy, which is to do, of course, where private sector fits in an investment and growth process, but also the way that translates into job. But similarly, uh, um, uh, the bottom, the state and non-presumed state providers can deliver these basic services. But all these things, fundamentally, we need somehow their state capacity. State capacity that organize this growth environment, state capacity that sets the context for the social policy, and we need to think about how, it, how it's uh, there. And then finally, underlying that is ultimately the politics that actually drives this, and there's definitely circles and, and arrows that go back from the whole what's happening to poor people into the political settlement and back. Then we see some things there, simple pictures there, and taxation is there as one of these things that maybe tries to start closing some of these links. How am I doing? Ah, well, that's okay. So we're getting, um, so we're getting a, a diagnosis. Now, behind it, of course, people write careful documents and reports and so on, but it's this visual representation. In fact, our Secretary of State said when she saw this, I say, I like this very much. I think DFID is being concerned too much with the bottom part of the picture. May it please get more involved in the top part of the picture as well, which is something we're doing now, getting more in the economics things as well, but including also on the politics. 
So, but when we start doing this, and I'm start not even giving you much uh, time to look at it, oops. but this is essentially when we end up doing this on Nigeria. So by now we've done this in lots of countries and trying to actually shape the discussion. Are we doing the right kind of things? And I can imagine there's a lot of red boxes in this kind of environment uh, in terms of all the kind of concerns we have. And trying to look for the space to act in these things, but keeping, keeping it focused, integrated. So let's not try to be too gloomy, but giving a very quick sense of some of the, of the outcomes. So first of all, you know, a lot of doom and gloom comes from it. Once you start looking through this kind of integrated lens of where we are, it looks pretty bad, especially in the kind of countries DFID works in, which is largely low-income countries or slightly screwed up middle -income, lower middle-income countries. Um, so then actually it gets pretty, pretty difficult. So in fact, we find two countries only where we feel like the politics is fundamentally aligned, where politics is defined by trying to defel, the, the deliver growth and poverty reduction. Now, if we don't have these things, it's very hard to be just, these are places where potentially we can be technocratic because there's a fundamental alignment of what we have to do. I'll let you guess which two African countries these are, um, but they are, they are some. And we get other things. State capability is often not about, fundamentally about the ability to act, but also the willingness to act. And so we have a lot of places where state capability seems to be present, where all kinds of interesting things are happening, but nothing, but there's just no willingness to act on the, on the right things involved. Of course, we get what you obviously would get when you take these lenses, state and politics very closely linked. And there's also very little understanding about political economy and the governance links with, with growth. We tend to focus largely on elections, on that kind of stuff in a lot of the analysis, or on civil service. But business state relationship, business politics relations doesn't get enough. And, if, and then, of course, we need to take politics and dodginess in this whole picture. You know, uh, the JEP article by Alex Mokley Robinson is something that helped, in fact, to make a, a little summary of that, help people to think a little about some of the policy <coughs> things. Lots of challenges, places where there's no state. DRC, I spent my summer in DRC, as one does on holiday, and, um, and it's actually, you know, fundamentally big questions about our different statist approach to develop. And I was glad to say, Tim, that fundamentally it is still about state capacities. We actually worry about some of these places. Are we doing the right thing by trying to think we need to build up these states? Fundamentally, there is actually service delivery there, done by two of the biggest multinationals in the world, the Catholic Church and the Protestant missions, who have vertical integration can overcome a lot of the state capacity and corruption problems by being vertically integrated. They know which customs agents they have to go through. If you're Protestant, you go by the evangelical one. If you're Catholic, you choose the Catholic customs post and you can cut your costs and so on, so you work. So the state is not present and you can do all kinds of things. So this is lots of challenges for us to how to work with it. It's a little bit difficult not to talk, to, to talk too much in public about it. But it's basically getting somehow beyond the kind of way we try to deal with the state and working on it and, and, and getting the state to act. Let me finally, and I'm sorry to the chair, to take a, a few minutes on this one element, given that that's a common element with the others as well. How do you try to approach this thing about the self-financing route? Something we find very important is that actually we want to start thinking about the exit from aid. And that's a very strong push we have, and I think it's absolutely right. We should look for more and more places where we can find ways of exiting from aid. Aid can be dysfunctional, aid can be disruptive, aid is not necessarily the solution to all the problems, or even though that sometimes gets the impression created. So finding ways to getting new things about it. We have a big tax agenda, we have a strict instruction that a lot of the things we do, we have to think about all the time about if we set something up, what's going to be the self-financing system for this system. Is it from general taxation or specifically in a part of thing we do? Not just because of the financing point of view. Indeed, thinking about incentives it can deliver in the state, but also the political economy perspective, also that uh, Tim was referring on, on it. You know, we're big supporters of this agenda now, including getting uh, the, the UK government department, essentially HRMC, all over uh, as well. And we'll see how, how good it is. It has lots of challenges and opportunities, and I'll finish with this. Tax revenues are, uh, can we trying to get tax revenues to be a much more a main source for development finance as it is. There's been progress in tax uh, uh, revenue as percent of the GDP. There's a bit of dodgy data, lots of dodgy data in that space. It seems some data suggests it's gone off quite nicely, but it's actually quite important 
but actually the tax story we get, we worry a bit that it's largely been by indirect taxation. It's not the kind of one we think it creates the citizen uh, state or the, uh, the state business link in a proper set. There's only modest increase in personal cost corporate taxation at the moment in the world. Um, we get in a series of tax challenges, lots of opportunities. In fact, if we were getting Ghana to some kind of norm level that actually sensible developing countries have, um, basically we, we could get rid of all aid. Ghana is one of these countries where clearly we could get uh, the kind of progress that Kieran is talking about. But very little income taxation in a lot of countries. For example, India is the shocking figure, 2.7% of the population pays personal income tax in India. If, if the narrative is about getting close to the citizen, the relationship between the state and the citizen, we have a lot to do. And that's something we need a much stronger evidence base. It gets used a lot, different uses it a lot to justify why we're doing it, but actually the, the, we need to get much better in understanding the state citizen, and indeed I would say the state business relationship as well. If I may just two, three quick examples on DRC, an example that I like using now, because there's a lot of tax reform going on there. You know, the tax authority is being strongly strengthened by the, by the IMF, and all seems to be very sensible. So we get this wonderful outcome that after several months of VAT and the receipts increasing by the government, now suddenly we actually get repayments, so this um, reimbursement of VAT is actually larger than revenue now from VAT. So think about that, how that is happening. Uh, basically, basically the whole system finds a way of now actually handling in receipts that are fictitious and get VAT re repaid, but actually there is no collection anymore either. So that's kind of the absolute absurd thing. Um, a new tax law in the DRC, creating that corporate taxation improving, a massive increase of, of, of corrupt pressures on big businesses. Basically, because what is the, the strategy? Tax laws are a great thing to do in a very fragile economy, a very, very, very corrupt state as well, because that's the moment you can go and have the conversation with the big business. You make the massive tax bill, as I talked to several firms, incredible tax bills, percentages of GDP are being charged from these businesses, and then the negotiation can start about how much they should pay to get, get rid of it. So you want to be a bit careful with that. We get a lot of in these kind of settings um, overinvestments, overinvestments in, uh, in uh, tax lawyers and accountants in firms. You have massive administrative departments now in all these big firms. Very similar to what Svensson talks about, you know, is there's a risk of corruption. You have to do certain investments. Well, it's basically lawyers and accountants. Vodafone tells me that, oh, that's what they do in Africa in general, and you get a whole series of, uh, of different things like that. And of course, you introduce legal systems of transfer pricing, for example, should I name the, yeah, why not, BAT, British American Tobacco, uh, growing the leaves in the east of Congo, exporting them to Mombasa, putting on a ship to then move to Kinshasa to make them into cigarettes. Twice they can pass the border, great opportunities for transfer pricing. Um, anyway. And then the final thing, the push with VAT and so on, is a lot of indirect taxation. So in the last slide here, things we, I think we need to do. I mean, for us in DFIT, we want to get this more integrated. There's an awful lot of research agencies and others have referred to it already. We do need lots of serious political economy analysis of the business-state relationship and how the state capacity, how it deals with business and so on, and the interaction with policies. This is not about doing business, the rule setting, but actually is the real detailed analysis of what's going on. And if I may say so, I think we've overdone a little bit targeting civil servants as the only bad people in this whole uh, story on political economy. We could do things. And I'm rethinking eight. You know, it's very important, this transition out of it and thinking how we actually deal with the states we're dealing with, because it's a very different relationship with very different international capital market situations. It's a very different relationship. You know, for example, in Mozambique, we have this total transformation of the relationship between donors and government now, because Mozambique knows that in, within 10 years it will double its GDP because of natural resources. And of course, the emerging democracies, uh, Paul talks these days quite a lot about risks of populism in this kind of context. And in general, let's get a better understanding of how we deal uh, with tax, on, on tax and deal with its consequences. Sorry to run off time. Thank you.
Can I encourage our panel to, to, to reform as a panel? Um, uh, we, you might have noticed, but um, only one of our panelists stuck to time. That was the guy who'd built effective tax organizations. Is this a... <laughs> um, um, we're going to have uh, two questions plus a remark from the chair, and then we're going to roll down the panel, and then we close. So, two questions. Um, who's going to start us off? There's an enthusiastic young lady in the front, so she will start. Anke Höfler, CSAE. I've got a question for Kieran Holmes. Um, what, in your experience, is the most important element of tax reform? And I'm sort of thinking more of the microeconomics, the changing of norms that um, Tim Besley was talking about. Sort of, um, I know that in Burundi you made people work in open plan offices, you have, you make them declare their assets uh, and so on. So what works, what doesn't, what has had unintended consequences in your experience? Thank you. Okay, well, anybody else? Whilst, whilst, you're, whilst you're thinking, the chair's going to come up with a couple. So, um, we've, we've heard from Stefan that state capacity is a, basically a function of willingness to act, not of capability to act. It's willingness. And from Tim, that it's not the process of acquiring power, it's the, it's the process of holding power that really matters. So if, if those two things are right, that it's willingness to act and it's the holding power that matters, is the implication that really for state capacity, what's fundamental is building checks and balances on the use of power. Um, so that's one question, um, essentially back to, uh, to Tim. And then there's a question um, for, for, for both Stefan and Kieran, and, and that is, um, I rather suspect that, that culture is a constraint on capacity. And I'll give you an example outside fiscal capacity, but it's a very dramatic one, because the, the, a core function of the state is security, and that's how states emerged. Um, you remember the tragedy, recent tragedy in Kenya, the, the shopping mall um, being overrun by, by terrorists. And remember that went on for days and days um, and we exposed, discovered the one reason it went on for days and work days was that when the Kenyan army was called in, um, the soldiers took this as an opportunity to loot the shopping mall. Now, why that's so striking is that in many ways the, 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 the organization in all states, which is kind of most effective, where it's easiest to build a, a culture of effectiveness in the organization, is the army. Um, George Akerlof's little book, Identity Economics, starts with, 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 a, with a picture of the, of the army. People basically internalize the objectives. So um, if, if, if even the army can't internalize the objectives of the state, um, is there a problem of getting a tax authority to internalize the capacity of the state? Now, Kieran does seem to have actually tackled that problem successfully, the problem in of getting tax inspectors to internalize objectives. And so I'd like him to speak a little bit about how that's done. Since the chair's waffled on, you should have had a chance to think of a second question, if anybody wants to come in with a, with a second question. Okay, yes. Anand Rajaram from the World Bank. Um, when I heard Stefan's presentation and Tim, your presentation, the notion of political economy as being central to development comes through very strongly. Uh, but an organization like the World Bank is still a little bit uh, distant from that idea. Uh, I think we, some of us are trying to make this a much more integral part of our thinking, but there's still a long way to go. So how do you get a major organization like that to accept the thinking that you have? Or is this something that only a bilateral can do and a multilateral cannot? Great. Let's roll down the panel, starting with Tim, and sort of two to three minutes each, I'm afraid. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. Um, yes, 
the answer to your question, if you remember what it was, is, is it all about, <laughs> is, is, is the creation of state capacity all about building executive constraints? I think the, the, both the theory and the evidence, I think, it's such as we have it, supports the proposition that um, elections are a complete sideshow. Yeah. And therefore, if we really want to understand both practically how to build state capacity and theoretically, then we would focus on executive constraint. Um, but I, I, I'm only yeah. going to say I agree with really. you. Yeah. On, on the um, final point on the, the World Bank, it's not true that it has to be a multilateral. I did a review about five years ago of the um, lending policy of the EBRD. And one thing I hadn't appreciated about the EBRD is they actually have in their charter a commitment to democracy um, and a lending strategy to support democratization. Now, as I said to you earlier, I think it's wrong to focus on the term democratization. On the building governance, effective governance as a precondition and having that, I view that as about political economy. So I don't think it's infeasible for an international organization to say that it wishes to be a conduit of effective governance and effective state building as part of its core mandate. I think when it tries to dress it up in the form of democracy, that's, that's more problematic. Mm. Um, so I, 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 am, I do think, A, it can be done by multilaterals, and B, it should be done in the right language, in the right place where it really matters, which is linked to my uh, answer to Paul about checks and balances yeah. in particular. So replace policy conditionality by governance conditionality, I guess. Yeah, although I don't like the, the C word in that context. I think I would want to frame it somewhat okay. differently than conditionality. Okay. Kieran. Um, yeah, to start quickly with the, uh, the question on, on the important elements of tax reform and what we've done in places like Burundi, Rwanda and other countries, uh, essentially we've, we've tried to move the tax system away from trade taxes uh, towards uh, more, more reliance on income taxes and on uh, VAT excises. And so excises are a great tax in developing countries because it's a broad-based tax which brings in revenue even when you have countries which has only a very small percentage of the population actually have an income. But on, on the operational side, uh, uh, doing things like uh, creating a code of conduct <clears throat> to which people have to sign up, having tax officers declare their assets, uh, which is what we've done in both Burundi and Rwanda, has been hugely important. Uh, and breaking down walls in tax offices. Uh, my staff in Burundi did not believe it, uh, that I was going to do it because I kept telling them that we were going to do this. And one weekend, uh, after one weekend, they came back in on Monday morning and all the walls were gone. And suddenly people could see each other. They could see who was working, who wasn't working. They could see, uh, they could share work. And of course, you know, when you break down all the walls, then there's no place for people to go and hide and do little uh, private deals with taxpayers and so on. Everything is out in the open. So changing the culture of the organization involves doing all those things, creating discipline in the tax office. We used to say, in, uh, it used to be a joke in Rwanda that the Rwanda Revenue Authority was, was the third disciplined force in, in, uh, in Rwanda. And we did enforce discipline. And, and when, when, you, when you change the mindset in, in, in institutions like revenue authorities, uh, you, can, you can actually change it for good. And when you collect uh, tax revenues at the levels that we collect them, you end up turning corruption into revenue. Uh, and, and businesses actually prefer this because businesses, businesses can pay as much in corruption as they would have paid in taxes or almost as much as they would pay in taxes. But in return, when they pay taxes, they get uh, certainty and stability uh, which is what business is like. So uh, you mentioned Westgate, and of course Westgate you know, was the, the demonstration of the complete failure of institutions as far as I'm concerned, the looting that went on and so on. Also the fact that the tax office probably you know, wasn't as, as uh, alert as it should have been as to, as to how many businesses were actually uh, registered in, in, in Westgate. So um, the, the point I suppose is that uh, revenue institutions by their very nature, they have to be, uh, they are an institution of state, they have to be created along, uh, along lines that work, they have to be created with discipline, they ha you have to change the culture, but if you, do the, if you do achieve that, then the rewards can be superb. I just, yeah, uh, quickly, first on the, on the point that, Paul, that you're making, uh, culture matters. I, um, I, I, I think, you know, I probably would use the word, the word uh, some kind of 
norms or whatever. But if we if we think about it, and, and I'm talking now as a bureaucrat, uh, it's a it's a kind of very common thing. If you start thinking through your own systems, um, you know, culture can save on carrots and sticks, and it has a it, it provides a real saving in that respect. But when do you get that? Is then of course it needs an internal internalization of the of what you stand for. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing because it is, we, we, and I do think we see in, in African countries, in pockets even of civil service, vilified in general, that actually you have these norms and, and cultures that are actually quite high. Actually, it's quite interesting in DFID as well. So within government, uh, DFID is the se score second highest in this kind of identification with the objectives of the organization after the rural parks. Um, uh, which is uh, quite, quite, always quite an achievement, but that's quite an important, and so as a result you can save in an awful lot of these kind of other kind of things of doing it. i just quickly saying something on, and, and I think this is linked to Anki's question, I can't remember what the question is, but I have at least an answer to something here, which is, <laughs> but it links to also what Tim was talking about on the, on the EBRD and so on, which is one of the things that I think we should learn in, in, in development and I'm speaking definitely also for my own organization. And of course, we want to achieve results. But maybe the results that should matter, the only ones you should count is after your project finished. And that it's the results that actually, what is afterwards, not during while you're there with all your financial and other support. And to really say, you know, judge the success of a program on the basis of the results after the project has finished and to actually try to get in that le language of delivering change. And it's linked to that, uh, the question on the bank. I think the bank has really missed the trick. And it's moved to diagnostics and it's decided to make them apolitical. Political economy has disappeared from it. They're going to do a lot of diagnostic work now in the coming years, and they're going to be for years now doing diagnostic work. And it's empty from any political economy because it is all the client-driven stuff and they can't really do something. They have not thought through how to do it. And, it's, and the EBRD is a real thing. In fact, we went so far, we brought the EBRD to the World Bank to talk about what they're doing. I'm consciously talk about the language of transition because I think what, what the experience of the EBRD that team refers to, and they, they did an excellent review report at some point of it, is really, I think, where we're sitting in general with development. Not necessarily governance or a particular thing, but it's actually, is it contributing to some kind of transitional program that actually is of change institutionally and politically and economically in these countries and judge your performance on that. All right. Thank you very much. I think uh, we've had a really superb panel to, to close things. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to James to, uh, to close the conference. Thank you.